All right, good morning, guys. Good morning. Um, so I've been reading in some scriptures the last couple of days. I've been sharing with some of the guys in the house, and I've been looking at scriptures like uh, Luke 9, where Jesus fed the 5,000. And it says that he took the bread, he looked up to heaven, he blessed it, broke it, and distributed it. And then I read in other scriptures like John 17, before Jesus prayed that prayer, it said he looked up to heaven. And I was thinking about that in another scripture when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Um, he, he looks up to heaven and he prays to the Father and he said, Father, thank you for always hearing me. He says, you always hear me, but for the sake of the people that are around me, I said it aloud so that they would hear and they would believe. And I started to meditate on that, and I started to think about how Jesus knew where he came from. He knew where he would return. Jesus knew the realities of heaven. So when he lifted his eyes, he didn't just see the sky and some clouds and the sun. He seen so much more. He saw the beauty of the realities of heaven. And man, as uh, I started to think about that, it's just not Jesus that can experience that. But when we read in Acts 7, Stephen, right before he died, looked up at the realities of heaven and the heavens were parted and he saw the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. So we too have an opportunity today as we, we worship and, and pray and spend some time in the Word uh, to be able to see the beauty and the realities of heaven. Uh, so I love you guys and I look forward to worshiping with you. <laughs> Lord Jesus, and I pray for us just to hear clearly from you this morning. Lord, I pray against any outside distractions. And Lord Jesus, man, just help us uh, empty ourselves out, Lord, so we can be filled with you and your spirit. Lord, Lord let today, man, just you know, till up the hard hearts that are here, man, to transform our hearts to look more and more like you and less and less like ourselves, Lord Jesus. So... Lord, I, pro I pray that it also doesn't end on us today, Lord, but, uh, man, we just, as my Lord was saying, man, as uh, Jesus was distributing the bread after he was blessed, man, I pray that we distribute what you are blessing us with during this time. I love you, King, and it's in your name. <laughs> Jesus, I just want to thank you for allowing all of us to sit here this morning to hear your word. Jesus, um, I pray that we just let the distractions fall away from us and that we just really listen to your word and listen to what you are telling our leaders about us, Jesus, and that, that you are the true God and that we should turn to you and just... <coughs> Keep on pressing in, Jesus. That is my prayer for us this morning. Amen. I became a free 
felt like fighting in get my veins. By So going into our communion time, uh, you know, last week you know, I was supposed to do communion, but uh, there was a bunch of miscommunication. But I was able to share my communion with with what Je what Jesus had on my heart with the guys in the Mansfield house, and uh, you know, I really just pointed back to where I was. <laughs> literally earlier this year to where I am now and you know it was coming out of Jeremiah ver uh, chapter 31 verses 31 to 34 and then this morning uh, Shane asked me to do communion and right then and there Jesus dropped on me Ephesians chapter 2 I'm like okay how does this make sense and then as I'm looking over these two uh passages of scripture it's like they both connect and it all points to uh, the promise that Jesus had for us to the life that we now live now that we have fully accepted him and living our lives for him and so coming out of Jeremiah right now it says the day is coming says the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah this covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them out of the land, I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though. I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone, from the least to the greatest, will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. 
and then coming out of Ephesians chapter 2, you know, it says, made alive with Christ. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point us <laughs> to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you... When you believed and you can't take credit for this it is a gift from God salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it for we are God's masterpiece he created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago and so I want us to take a moment to really thank Jesus for what he has done for us even even as he has allowed each of us to sit in this very room to give him the praise and glory that he deserves in this moment. You know, I know that he's still working on each and every one of us in, in, in the way that he intends, but it's to give him glory. And so let us take a moment and just thank him. King Jesus, man, it, it is, it's always good to, to just stop what we're doing and the busyness of the day just to reflect on, on our gratitude and our thankful hearts to all the things that we've experienced, Lord, or things that no human <laughs> can could have accomplished. These are miracles that, that are divine that only you could have produced in our lives. And, um, it's amazing to be able to experience you closely. And I pray, I pray for the church, Jesus, that we would continue to see people be saved and that you would continue to be known and receive more and more glory and we could learn how to live out accurately being the body of Christ. And it would be pleasing to you and that you would continue to teach us. And it's, it's, it's something that uh, when we're thankful and we have hearts full of gratitude, Jesus, we uh, we don't seem to be worried and anxious. And that is also because of you. So all of us are in this room because of what you've done on the cross. And we, we, we love you. And I pray that you teach us to love others. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Let's take communion.
amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Though I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave.
and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity.
morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. of being here to, to spend time with you, Lord. We thank you for making a way for us to, to press in and know you and to be and to come closer to you, Lord. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, we receive this return your response to us, Lord, and uh, pray that we can give it to these Jews. We love you, Lord. Thank you, and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to be, the main portion of this is going to be Hosea 6, <coughs> verses 1 through 7. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us. Now he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us so that we might live in his presence, may live in his presence. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of rains during the spring. Oh, Israel and Judah, what should I do with you? Asked the Lord. For your love vanishes like the morning mist and disappears like dew in the sunlight. I sent my prophets to cut you to pieces, to slaughter you with my words, with judgments as inescapable as light. I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. But like Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. <laughs> Jesus has been teaching me through this. He's been showing me things that uh, that like to creep up here and there, you know, whether it be getting tossed around by the waves when things come about, whether it be Jay has to know all the details. Um, and so, you know, this is for me too. Um, and so verses 1 through 3. It says, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us, and he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Actually, let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of rains or the spring. And I remember the times that you know, I've been coming around here for almost four years, and, you know, sometimes I think, you know, I should be farther than I am, but I'm right where Jesus has me, and there would be times where I thought I knew that I knew better, and I was, I was like, come on, Jesus, let's go, I'm going to come, follow, I'm going to go follow you out here, but every time I went out there, I turned my back on whether it be drug addiction, whether it be sexual sin, whether it be <coughs> me being me. And he let me have it. He tore me to pieces, you know. Um, deeper, darker, harder. It got worse every time. But just like a lot of us, he kept us sustained. He knew that he wanted us to be here. He knew that he would be bringing me back. And he wanted to heal me. He wanted to bandage my wounds. He just wanted me to get to know him. And I knew that when I was out there, I didn't know him at all. Otherwise, I would have never left. And so, a point I have for this is realizing our need for a Savior and having faith and action behind it. And in Luke 8, verses 
verses 42 through 48. 42b, down through 48. It says, as Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Somebody deliberately touched me. I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her, heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She knew that she had probably, she had probably been one that was out there and, and, and getting wrecked her whole life. You know, she was always doing things in her own strength, you know, going to these doctors, spending all her money, trying to find a way to heal herself. But then she realized who Jesus was, and, and, she, and she used faith to because she knew that if she touched him, that she would be healed. Um, another point is he requires intimacy and closeness. Uh, a couple pages over in Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar with him. With him. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them all off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. When Jesus answered his thoughts, Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debt. Who do you suppose loved him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said, and he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash my, the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the, first, from the time I first came in, she had not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and there are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shall go into little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. And over in Luke 10, verses 38 and 42. It says that Jesus and his disciples continued on the way to Jerusalem. They came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. And so these two... They had intimacy with Jesus. They were trying to get to know him. They were loving on him. They wanted to be a part of him. They pressed in to know him, and he responded. Awesome. In verse 4 in Hosea 6, it says, O Israel and Judah, what should I do with you, asked the Lord? For your love vanishes like the morning mist and disappears like dew in the sunlight. I see. I've been there. You know, how many times have we heard, what am I going to do with you? You know, we've heard that our whole life. Um, 
in my love, I would pray in the mornings. I would want Jesus to, to do something in me, but then a little while later, I'm, I'm not doing me again. Um, and it made me think of Luke 8, verse 5 through 8. says a farmer went out to plant his seed as he scattered it across his field some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it other seed fell along rocks where it began to grow but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture other seeds fell along thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants still other seed fell on fertile soil the seed this seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as the plant and uh you know, it talks about the love vanishing. Uh, I've been in those soils before. Where I was a rocky soil, I received it with joy. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's gone like that. I'm, I'm looking away. I'm looking at the waves. I'm looking at me. In verse 5, it says in Hosea 6, it says, I set my prophets to cut you to pieces, to slaughter you with my words, with judgments as inescapable as light. Having a solid foundation, um, listening to my leaders, because I know it's Jesus speaking through them to speak life into me. And in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Um, Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable with God. Give them reason to do this with joy, not with sorrow. That would certainly not be with be for your benefit. And then Ezekiel 3, 16 through 19. It says, After seven days, the Lord gave me a message. He said, Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for Israel. Whenever you receive a message from me, warn people immediately. If I warn the wicked, saying you are under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, they will die in their sins, and I will hold you responsible for their death. If you warn them, and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins, but you will have saved yourself because you obeyed me. And so, yeah, he has cut me pieces with his words. He has tried to get my attention through my leaders. Hey, you're, you're, you're uh, on a slippery slope. You're losing your footing. You're, you're drifting. Uh, it's time to reel it in before you crash and burn. How many times have I crashed and burned before? You know, and so um, I don't look at the leaders as, hey, there's some guy telling me what to do anymore. I know it's Jesus directing my life. Verse 6 in Hosea says, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt, burnt offerings. It's foundation work. We must really dig deep and get to know Jesus on an intimate level. You can't be checking off the boxes, but be all in. And in Luke 6, 46 to 49, says, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? I'll show you what it's like when someone who comes to me listens to my teaching and then follows it. He's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. When the flood waters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who built a house right on the ground without a foundation. When the floods sweep down against that house, and collapse into a heap of ruins. And then in Micah 6, 6 to 8, I remember to this day, the first time I ever saw this logo, 
and show it to me because I kept coming in and out, in and out of the house. And I'm like, what else do I got to do? What do I have to do to get, to get this right, to, to get the more viewers more? <laughs> like a six, six to eight. Um, it says, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings and yearling calves? Should we offer him ten thousand thousands of rams in ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And then verse 7, but like Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. Um, Romans 5. Verses 18 and 19. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. I've been good at being Adam. Been Adam my whole life. We all have, you know. Um, if we stay tethered to the Holy Spirit once we give our life to Jesus, if we stay tethered to the Holy Spirit, we will be more like Jesus and look more like Jesus. And it will spill out over everyone else that is trying to find the relationship with Jesus and looking for a Savior. And then we can have the privilege of being a part of changing their eternities. And so... A couple questions I have are, uh, what kind of soil are we? And uh, are we offering sacrifices and checking off the boxes, or are we truly pressing in, pressing in to know Jesus? And these are things that you can just think about, you know, as we come to our time of prayer. And, uh, I love you guys. I love you guys.